Imagine for a moment that you're a high school teacher. It's the last day of class, and you want to do something nice for your students. However, you have no idea how many of them are actually going to show up. You decide you'll bake one cookie for each student in the class, divide them evenly amongst the students who do come, and take the remainder for yourself. How many cookies would you expect to be left with? With probability questions like this, it's important to be specific about the conditions. It's not enough to say we don't know something. We have to precisely define our prior knowledge, or lack thereof. What probability distribution should we assign to the number of students who show up? In real life, assuming each person makes the decision independently, we'd expect it to somewhat resemble a normal distribution. But I want to assume that each number of students showing up is equally likely. Maybe they're all driving to school, one in front of the other, and they go over a drawbridge, and the drawbridge raises up at a random time, stopping everyone behind it in their tracks. I don't know, it's a math problem. Don't worry about it. We've got some number of students n, and we want to find the remainder of n when divided by 1, plus the remainder of n when divided by 2, etc., all the way up to the remainder of n when divided by n. Then we can divide by n to get the average remainder, or divide by n squared to get the average remainder as a fraction of n. I was playing around with the Windows calculator one day, you know, as one does, and I got curious about this. I tried some small numbers, didn't see any obvious patterns, and I got pretty excited about it. It seemed like such a simple problem that, as long as the answer wasn't trivial, it was bound to be interesting. What do you think will happen? I wrote a program to compute the answer for some large values of n, and I noticed something interesting. I plugged in 1,000 and got this. I plugged in 10,000 and got this. I plugged in 100,000 and got this. Finally, I plugged in a million and got this. It seems to be converging on about 0 0.17753 times n squared. The n squared makes sense. There are n terms in the sum, and as n gets bigger, each term has the potential to get bigger. But why 0 0.17753? What's so special about this constant? I was 15 at the time, and I wasn't sure how to go any farther with this, so I just accepted it as numerical fact and forgot about it until recently when I stumbled across the old code on my computer and I felt like there had to be more to this. When you're having trouble with a counting problem, it's often helpful to try counting something slightly different. A small change in perspective can provide a big insight. One thing I tried was counting the number of times that the remainder equals a certain number. If the remainder of n when divided by k is, say, 6, then we know k is a divisor of n minus 6, and also that k is greater than 6. Conversely, if k meets these criteria, we know the remainder is going to be 6. Although there's no simple formula for the number of divisors of a number, it's a well-studied function, so this seemed promising. However, I couldn't figure out how to fit in this bit about greater than 6, so it was back to the drawing board. Another way to look at the problem is, instead of counting the total number of cookies the teacher gets in each scenario, we could count the total number of cookies each student gets in each scenario. Here, as with many things, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's say there are 24 students in the class. Here's a 24 by 24 grid, where each column represents a cookie, and each row represents the scenario where that many people show up. For example, in the first row only one student shows up, so that student gets all 24 cookies. We'll color those squares red to indicate that those cookies ended up with the first student. If two students show up, they each get 12 cookies, so for the second row we'll color 12 squares red and 12 squares orange. The third row is 8 red, 8 orange, and 8 yellow for student number 3, etc. I gave each student up to number 12 their own color, but after that they're all pretty boring because they only ever get one cookie, so students 13 to 24 are all represented by black. The white squares represent the teacher. This is a cool picture, but it's not immediately obvious what it means for how many cookies each student gets. I mean, we end up with these, like, hyperbola shapes, which are sort of hard to think about. However, what it does show us is some interesting regularity in the number of cookies the teacher gets. Down here on rows 13 to 24, the teacher squares form a nice triangle. On these rows, all the students are only getting one cookie each, so each new student decreases the amount of cookies left for the teacher by one. Similarly, on rows 9 to 12, each student is getting two cookies each, so every new student decreases the amount of cookies the teacher gets by two. If we imagine dealing out the cookies like a deck of cards, the bottom triangle corresponds to the region where we're only dealing out one round of cookies, and the middle triangle corresponds to the region where we're dealing out two rounds of cookies. So maybe 
Instead of coloring each square by which student that cookie ends up with, we should color each square by which round each cookie is dealt out in. For example, if only one student shows up, then there are 24 rounds, with each cookie in its own round. If two students show up, there are 12 rounds of two cookies each. If three students show up, there are eight rounds of three cookies each, etc. Now this is a good picture. The boundaries between these regions are essentially straight lines, and this makes perfect sense. The first round has one cookie per person, so the red region has one new square per row. The first two rounds together have two cookies per person, so the red and orange regions together have two new squares per row, etc. As this grid gets bigger and bigger, these boundaries will approach perfect straight lines, all intersecting in the top left corner, with slopes of negative one, negative one half, negative one third, negative one quarter, and so on. So finding the limiting behavior as n approaches infinity becomes nothing more than a simple geometric exercise. This is one of my absolute favorite parts of math, being stuck on a problem and then seeing a picture that not only provides a path to the solution, but also makes intuitive sense. The more time I've spent algebraically banging my head against a wall, the more satisfying it is when everything clicks into place. It's like getting to a campsite late at night, stumbling around in the dark while you struggle to pitch your tent, and then waking up in the morning to a beautiful view. We could find the area of these white triangles directly, but it's even simpler to note that the triangle representing the kth round has a base of length n squared over k and a height of n squared over k, so its area is n squared over 2k squared. The total area of the colored triangles is then n squared over 2 times the sum of 1 over k squared from 1 to infinity. This is a very famous sum whose value turns out to be exactly pi squared over 6. It's known as the Basel problem, named in honor of Basil Born Leonard Euler, along with about 97% of all mathematical terms. If you're watching this video, I'm guessing that, like me, you've seen every single one of 3 Blue 1 Brown's videos multiple times, but just in case, they've got a very nice visual proof of it over there. So then, the total number of white squares, the value we're actually trying to compute, is n squared times 1 minus pi squared over 12. And what do you know? If we plug that constant into a calculator, it's about 0 0.17753. So there you have it, 15-year-old me. That's why it's special. You're welcome.